Hello everyone and welcome to our module on the posterior approach. In this video we will discuss the background and uses for the posterior approach to the hip, patient positioning, landmarks and incision, superficial and deep surgical dissections, the dangers involved with this approach, we will discuss extensile measures and we will end with a brief summary. The posterior approach to the hip is also called the southern or southern more approach. This is the most common approach to the joint. This approach has a few key advantages in that it requires only one assistant, there's no disruption of the adductor mechanism during surgery, the extensile measures can easily expose the femoral shaft. The approach is used primarily for arthroplasty, hemiarthroplasty, and revision arthroplasty. It is also used for ORIF of posterior acetabular fractures and open reductions of posterior hip dislocations. In terms of positioning, the patient is placed in the true lateral position with the affected side upwards. It is important to protect the bony prominences, especially the lateral malleolus and fibular head of the lower leg. A pillow should be placed between the patient's knees. The affected limb is sterilized and draped free in order that there may be motion about the hip during surgery. The greater trochanter is the most important landmark for this incision. The posterior edge of the greater trochanter is more superficial than either the anterior or lateral portions and is the most easily palpated. A 10 to 15 centimeter incision should be made, centered over the posterior aspect of the greater trochanter. This incision can be made either with the patient's hip straight or in 90 degrees of flexion. If the patient's hip is extended when the incision is made, the incision should be curvilinear. Alternatively, a straight incision could be made with the hip in 90 degrees of flexion. The straight incision will curve when the hip is extended. Whether the surgeon decides to make a curved incision with the hip extended or a straight incision with the hip flexed, the direction of the resulting incision will be in line with the fibers of the gluteus maximus proximally and in line with the femoral shaft distally. Once you have made your incision, it's time for the superficial surgical dissection. There's no true internervous plane in this approach as the dissection proceeds directly through the muscle belly of the gluteus maximus, which is pictured on the right highlighted purple. However, nervous supply to the gluteus maximus from the inferior gluteal nerve occurs well medial to where the muscle is split, resulting in minimal denervation. Once the skin is incised, you will encounter a thick fibrous connective tissue sheath that is likely to be thinner in elderly patients. This is the fascia lata. The fascia lata should be incised to the borders of the skin incision to expose the vastus lateralis and gluteus maximus. The gluteus is then split with blunt dissection. The gluteus maximus receives blood supply from both the superior and inferior gluteal arteries, which enter the deep surface of the muscle. Splitting the gluteus will cause arterial and venous bleeding. Care should be taken during blunt dissection to identify and coagulate arteries and veins before they are avulsed by the blunt dissection. Avulsed blood vessels will inevitably retract into the muscle belly, where they will be more difficult to monitor and control. After completing the superficial surgical dissection, the split gluteus maximus and deep fascia of the thigh should be retracted to expose the short external rotators, which lie over the posterior lateral hip capsule. The hip should be internally rotated to put the short external rotators on stretch. This will make these muscles more prominent and will pull the surgical field away from the sciatic nerve, which emerges from the deep from deep to the piriformis and rests on the short external rotators medial to their insertion on the greater trochanter. The sciatic nerve is encased in a fatty sheath. The nerve should not be seen during this approach, but it can be palpated. The image on the right highlights the short external rotators. The sciatic nerve is not shown in this image. Next, stay sutures are placed into the piriformis and obturator internus tendons before detachment. This allows for easier tendon repair during closure and makes these structures easily identifiable throughout the procedure. The short external rotators, which include the piriformis, superior and inferior gamelli, and the obturator internus are then detached from their femoral insertion and reflected backwards over the sciatic nerve. Reflecting these muscles exposes the posterior aspect of the hip capsule, which should be incised with a T-shaped capsulotomy. The hip is then dislocated with flexion and internal rotation. The sciatic nerve is the major nerve that is in danger during this approach and may be damaged by careless placement of retractors. Care should be taken to reflect the short external rotators over top of the sciatic nerve and place the retractors over the reflected short external rotators. The muscle bellies will protect the nerve. Rarely, one may encounter an anatomic variant of the sciatic nerve, where the tibial and peroneal division occurs in the proximal thigh. If you believe that you have found the sciatic nerve, but it appears small, this may be an early peroneal division. In this scenario, you must identify both divisions before proceeding with your dissection. Surgeons must be aware of the inferior gluteal artery. Branches of this artery will inevitably be cut during blunt dissection of the gluteus maximus.
The main arterial trunk is vulnerable at the lower border of the piriformis and is especially vulnerable during ORAF of pelvic fractures that involve the greater sciatic notch. If the inferior gluteal artery is damaged and retracts into the pelvis, the bleeding will be impossible to control from the posterior side. In this scenario, the patient should be flipped to the supine position, the abdomen should be opened, and the internal iliac artery, which is the feeding vessel to the inferior gluteal artery, should be tied off. There are several extensile measures that contribute to the posterior approach's popularity. For patients with obesity or with significant musculature about the hip, the skin and fascial incisions may both be extended. During the deep surgical dissection, the surgeon may gain additional exposure by detaching the upper half of the quadratus femoris muscle. Care should be taken to divide this muscle one centimeter from its insertion for purposes of hemostasis. Only the upper half of the muscle may be divided because the lateral femoral circumflex artery lies in close proximity deep to the lower half of the muscle belly. Also, the gluteus maximus may be detached from its insertion site and reflected superiorly. This is useful during revision arthroplasty to gain femoral exposure. Care should be taken to place retractors directly onto the bony acetabular rim to minimize soft tissue injury during this extensile measure. In this video, we discuss the posterior or southern more approach to the hip. The patient is placed in the true lateral position with the affected hip upwards. A curvilinear incision is made centered over the greater trochanter. There is no true internervous plane in this approach. The gluteus maximus is split in line with its fibers using blunt dissection. Once the gluteus is split, the short external rotators are identified, tagged with stay sutures, detached from their femoral insertion, and reflected over the sciatic nerve. It is important to be aware of anatomic variants of the sciatic nerve and to take care to avoid the inferior gluteal artery, especially during ORAF for pelvic fractures involving the greater sciatic notch. This approach is indeed extensile. This concludes our module on the posterior approach to the hip.